continuing our look verse by verse through the book of Acts. And today's topic is the key to all our troubles. And you'll see why um, I, I uh, put that title on it. I put the title so that people can, uh, can uh, follow us through the internet. Um, I'm, always, I'm always reminding you that although you're following along through the series, we always have people who this might be the only message or the first message they hear from our assembly and, and, and they, might, they might just look at it, well, let me see what the key to all our troubles. But it's going to be from this that they learn about rightly dividing the word. Last week, we looked at uh, why James. We, we looked at why Peter, who, who was the head apostle to the nation of Israel during the Lord's earthly ministry and early in the book of Acts, why all of a sudden Peter's ministry began to diminish. James became the prominent figure in the, uh, the, the little flock after Paul's salvation. And there was a reason. Because Peter, his ministry has to do with that kingdom program, that kingdom glory that the Lord Jesus Christ will give to the nation of Israel. Peter's ministry as head of the, the 12 apostles won't be prominent again until the kingdom. Um, God allowed James, the brother of John, to die in Acts 12, showing that there was a, a change in the program from Acts 9. And James, the Lord's brother, became prominent. And when you look at the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew epistles you have over here, Hebrews through Revelation, you have the book of Hebrews written by God. God is the, the author of that. God, he's the, first, he's the name on it. Then you have James. That's James, the brother of the Lord, Peter, and John. You have the book of James. You have First and Second Peter. Then you have um, John's ministry, First, Second, uh, and Third John, and then Revelation. And until the kingdom, Peter's, Peter's ministry won't be the issue. But in the book of Acts, you see the, the ministry of the Apostle Paul. It's the actions, the activities of the apostles. You see the Apostle Paul's ministry, as Peter's diminished, Paul's ministry increases. And that's what we're looking at. And when we talk about the key to all your troubles, look at Acts chapter 15 and verse 19. Acts chapter 15 and verse 19, where we left off. Wherefore, my sentence is, says James, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Now, this issue of troubling, we've been seeing that the trouble was, uh, hold your hand here, look at verse 24. What is the trouble? Verse 24, uh, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with what? Words subverting your soul, saying, ye must be circumcised and, and, and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. The way that the Gentiles were being troubled was that religious men, in this particular uh, case, religious Jews, Pharisees, believing Pharisees, the, the, the most religious sect in Israel, Pharisees who believed the, the, the gospel of the kingdom, who were, who were sealed, because after Paul was saved, all the, the, the men of Israel, all the people of Israel who had believed that Christ was their Messiah, were sealed. They're going to they, they're gonna inherit that kingdom out there, the second coming of Christ, to the earth. These men had a hard time letting go of the law of Moses. See, when Christ came, he didn't take, tell Israel not to keep the law of Moses. They kept the law, everything except the blood sacrifices, by the way. I'm talking about the little flock. We'll see that. But they were Jews zealous of the law. But when Paul showed up, Paul's ministry was a Gentile ministry. And he went out preaching to the Gentiles. Now, by the way, it's the heathen. There's lost Jews and lost Gentiles out there. Remember, the Jews were scattered all over the area there in the Middle East and, and West as well. And so Paul would be out there preaching the gospel of grace. Um, so, but look what he says there in verse 24 again. For as much as we have heard that certain, went, certain which went out from us have troubled you with words. And the words were saying that you had to be circumcised and keep the law. Now, in our day, circumcision is not a huge issue. That's not that religious outward performance of circumcision. That was a religious thing God gave to the nation of Israel through Abraham. He put it in the law of Moses. They were to circumcise their sons as, as that covenant that he made with the nation of Israel. Circumcision is not the big issue, but you can you can substitute another outward performance uh, ritual and rite of water baptism for circumcision today. Today. In our day, water baptism is huge. It's just as big as circumcision. Uh, circumcision was something that you did with your young, your young son, your, 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 a child. So people, people say, well, should we baptize infants? 
We have what they call confirmation, where they dedicate the infant to the Lord and pour water and oil, all this stuff on. That's just circumcision. It's, it's, it's water baptism today, but that's what they did back here. Do you need to be water baptized to be saved, people say? And if so, how do we do it? Do we dunk them? Do we sprinkle them? Do we do it in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, the book of Matthew says, or do we do it in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 2? It's all of these questions and confusion about water baptism, and water baptism is not even the issue today. Hold your hand here and go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Again, these, this might be familiar to you guys, um, but there, like I said, there are people who listen to this for the first time who wonders, well, why would Brother Ron say water baptism is not an issue today? By the way, we do need to be baptized today. I'll show you that, but it's not water baptism. Baptism in the Bible, there's about 12 different ones. Baptism simply means to be totally identified with, some, with something or someone. Verse 17, 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Paul speaking, For Christ sent me not to baptize. Now, in the context, he's speaking about water baptism but to preach the gospel. Notice that when Paul preaches the gospel, he's not to water baptize. That was different than back here. The Lord told the 12, Matthew 28, Mark 16, 16, he says, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing every creature, uh, uh, Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You had to be baptized to be saved. Peter says it in Acts 2, repent. And be baptized for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, he tells the nation of Israel. Matthew 28, he says, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In order for them to go and preach the gospel in Israel's program, water baptism was a part. Paul says here that Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Keep reading. Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 1. Not with wisdom of words lest the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect. For the preaching of the cross, is the, that's the issue. Paul, Paul takes something that Peter says the cross is wicked in Israel. In Israel, Peter says, with wicked hands, Acts chapter 3, ye slew and hung on a tree, speaking of Messiah. Paul says the good news is the cross today. The cross is wicked in Israel, but it's good for us. We don't need to be water baptized in order to be saved. It's the preaching of the cross. By the way, when he says not with wisdom of words, if you put water baptism on a grace believer today, there's whole denominations, the Baptist denomination and others, who use water baptism as an outward sign of an inward faith, they claim. There's not a verse in scripture that says water baptism is an outward sign of inward faith. Water baptism was a requirement for salvation in the prophetic program. You do need to be baptized, though. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Look at verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Remember, baptized means to be identified, totally identified, into one body. So the Spirit of God, capital S, Spirit of God, baptizes the believer into the body of Christ. See that? The one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. We have, all, we have been all made to drink into one spirit. That, that drink into one spirit has to do with totally identified with what the spirit of God. That's where our, our, our life comes. And he baptizes us into the church, the body of Christ. Why is that important? Is it a big deal to add water? Ah, it's just our tradition. Let's just sprinkle them. By the way, water baptism in the Bible is a sprinkling. All through scriptures, I will sprinkle them with clean water, God says in the prophets. It's a sprinkling. But is it important to have, uh, is it a big deal to add water to it? Well, go to Ephesians chapter number four. Go to Ephesians chapter number four. You need to remember this when, when people try to get you to submit to water baptism today. It's a huge issue. It's as huge an issue as circumcision was back in that day. When you add water to a believer's salvation, remember, circumcision was to be, sa you, to be part of that covenant. If you weren't circumcised, you were cut off from the blessings of God. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 5. Speaking about the verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit 
and the bond of peace. These are the things that we uh, uh, unite in as members of the body of Christ. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. There's the body of Christ. There's the one spirit of God and how he works today. The one hope of your calling is a heavenly hope. We're called to the, for the heavenly places. One Lord, there's the Lord Jesus Christ. One faith, that's the body of information, the doctrine, Pauline doctrine. How many baptisms? One baptism. And the, okay, wait a minute now. The one baptism, most saints think it is water. Whole denominations build their doctrine off the water baptism. So according to their doctrine, the one baptism of Ephesians 4 or 5 has to be water. The problem is when you look at the word of God, he tells you that it's the spiritual baptism. He talks about it in Romans 6. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? If that's water baptism, as one of the brothers said, Brother Dwayne said at the, at the conference, he said, that's some powerful water. That's some powerful water that you can sprinkle on somebody and get them to be, die with Christ, buried with Christ, raised to Christ, and seated in heavenly places with Christ, and you just sprinkle them with water. Heard the radio yesterday. There's a Lutheran guy on there, a real famous guy on the radio. People say, well, uh, uh, you believe that we can baptize our, wa uh, our babies in water to be for salvation? He says, yes. She says, can I do it at home? <laughs> he thought for a second. It's like just giving a bath. We give our baby a bath. Just, I, I baptize her all the time, I guess. <laughs> That's, that's silly. And then he went into his religious little thing. No, it has to be a priest and blah, blah, blah. Or, well, you know, whatever. Some religious do. That's, that's nonsense. The one baptism for the church, the body of Christ, is something that the Spirit of God does the moment you get saved. If you want to remember something, there are some certain things that happen when you get saved. Uh, see, the way you remember it is, is like a crib, a baby's crib, or multiple cribs, Okay. They're circumcised. Paul says over there in Colossians, you're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. You're regenerated over there in, uh, Titus in the book of Titus, chapter 3. Uh, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy has he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. He, he regenerates your spirit. Your spirit is dead and trespasses and sins. God brings it alive. You're indwelt. The Spirit of God is given to, to you, Romans 5 says, Ephesians 1.13. We'll look at that in a minute. You're baptized, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. And then you're sealed, uh, Ephesians 1.13. Um, in whom you also trusted after that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise to the day of redemption. So good way to remember, circumcised, regenerated, indwelt baptized and sealed all happen the moment you trusted Christ and they're all spiritual. No works of anybody's hands. That's important. Um, go with me to Galatians chapter number one, because when people add stuff to God's word, it will trouble you. Galatians chapter number one. Look at verse seven. Start at verse six. Galatians chapter one, verse six. What I believe is Paul's first epistle that he wrote. The first issue he has to deal with is people who were grace believers who got saved by the gospel of grace, no works of their own, having been confused or, or deceived by Satan and his ministers to go back under the law, a performance-based acceptance system to please God. Galatians chapter 1, I noticed that Paul usually goes into some salutations with other uh, saints and other epistles. This one, he gets right to the issue. Verse, one, verse 6. I, what's that next word? Marvel. There's pure astonishment and surprise as Paul thinks about the Galatians. He was just with them not long ago, teaching them grace. And watch what happened. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul is the one who gave them the grace of God. They remove themselves from Paul, from the Lord, unto another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another. It's really not another good news, really. But there be some that do what? Trouble you and would pervert 
the gospel of Christ. And the way you make the gospel right, you, a, a pervert is something, someone, he, he is, it's, it's unclean. The way you pervert the gospel of Christ, the grace gospel, is to add works to it. The moment you add water baptism, any other thing today that people add to it, you pervert the gospel of Christ. You make it of non-effect. And if that person is lost and you add a work to it, they'll never get saved. Not, not listening to your message. Now, I do know God. His will is that men be saved. If someone wants to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and a minister is hindering that, not giving a clear gospel, God will give that person a clear gospel. No man can stop God giving his gospel of grace to someone who wants it. But there are people who hinder God's work. Well, look at verse Hold your hand. Forget that. Go to chapter 5. Go over to chapter 5, verse 12. Look at chapter 5 of Galatians. Paul still is talking about this issue. Chapter 5, look at verse 12. In fact, start at verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach, what? Circumcision. Now, remember, I'm going to just substitute. I'm, I'm not, the issue with circumcision there, but so you can get the issue for our day, because circumcision is not a big, it's, it was a huge religious issue in that day. I'm going to show you, so you can understand what he's saying, I'm going to put the huge religious issue of water baptism there. Now watch this. He says, if I yet preach circumcision. That means Paul was preaching circumcision once in his life. Now that was before he was saved. He was a Pharisee. He was a religious zealot Jew, Pharisee. And when he went out there preaching, he preached circumcision and keeping the law of Moses according to the word of God, okay? But when Christ came and gave him the revelation of mystery and made him Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, he stopped preaching circumcision. Look what he says here. Verse uh, 11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? It's like saying today, we suffer for, for not preaching water baptism for salvation or for an outward sign of inward faith. Paul says, if I was going along with the religious program preaching circumcision or water baptism today, why are we still getting persecuted? If you go along with the religious program, everybody's happy. He says, why do I yet suffer persecution? Verse 11, then is the offense of the cross cease. See, what Paul did, he took everything out of the hands of men, the performance little things that men want to do, and put it all on the cross of Christ. I love dealing with people about their problem, the key to all our troubles. Can I tell you, you're the, we're the problem. When I deal with people, and I deal with a lot of people, it, it's funny, you deal with just a lot of different personalities and problems, and people is just the, the, the type of job I have as a minister, you get a lot of people telling you their problems. That's fine, that's my job. Self is the problem, self. In 99.9% .9 of the time, you got that 1% of the time where you're a victim of someone else's self. But usually, it's our own. And it's a lack of walking in Pauline doctrine we're going to see. This is the issue. People are too focused on themselves and not on the Lord. And so what I do as a minister, I take it off you and your performance and what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. And I put it on the preaching of the cross. I put it on Christ. But I've learned also some people don't want their problem solved. That sounds funny, doesn't it? Some people like to just talk about the troubles. I'm not the guy, Dan, because I'm going to give you answers from God's word, and it's going, the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all I got for you. Look what he says here. Verse 12, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. You know what Paul is saying? He's talking about believers, too, men who believe, who just won't let their pride go over to the religious system and believe God's grace message. That's the same word destroyed over there in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 3. Him shall, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, go, go over there. I want you to see something. 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse 16. As Paul speaks about the judgment seat of Christ and how every man will at the judgment seat of Christ have their ministry judged by the word of God. Who, Paul? By the Lord Jesus. 
Look what he says here. 1 Corinthians 3, start at verse uh, 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a what? Reward. Colossians 3, that's the reward of the inheritance. Verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. By the way, that's eternal security. 2 Timothy 2 says, if we believe not, yet he abided faithful, he cannot deny himself. You're a member of his body. When I say you have eternal life as a present possession, never to lose it, that's the truth. You're going to suffer loss. You're not going to have the reward of the inheritance in the heavenly places. But you'll be saved just like if you lived in a big house and that house was on fire and the fire and you're outside the window, smoke is billowing and the firemen get that ladder up and they just grab you. Your clothes is on fire. You burn everything off. You smell like smoke, but they get you out of there. You lost everything, almost your life. Well, that's how it is for most believers. Ninety nine percent of believers will get there. Their entire lives will be burned up because they didn't follow the Apostle Paul as he followed the Lord. They'll be saved, yet so is by fire. Verse 16. Why? Know ye not that ye, that's the body of Christ, are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? Look here. When you're talking about God's word and you don't do it from a Pauline dispensational viewpoint, when he talks about the spirit of God dwelleth in you, we're indwelt by God the spirit. Okay, we're circumcised by God, the spirit. We're regenerated by God, the spirit. We're indwelt by by him. We're baptized by him. We're sealed by him all at the moment of salvation. When you don't follow Paul as he follows the Lord, you begin speaking things that you ought not to other believers, telling them about how God has done this or done that, which he didn't do, telling them, here's what God wants you to do when he doesn't. Watch what happens. You're destroying the temple of God. Verse 17, if any man, what's that next word? Defile. Do you understand what it means to defile in Scripture? In that temple, in that physical temple out there in the Old Testament, it was to be holy and pure and clean in there. And you could defile it by not having the right sacrifices and the right attitude and things, and God would kill them. Destroy them right there. Hey, the high priest that is said in Jewish lore, would, they, would, they would put a rope around this man. He would go in there in the Day of Atonement once a year in the Holiest of Holies, put a rope with some bells because nobody else could go in there. And just so that the fire of God wouldn't smite him if he had sin, so they could pull him out just in case he dies. They needed to hear him moving around. If he, if he stopped moving around, they wouldn't hear the bell. All they could do is pull on the rope and bring his body out if that happened. That's what they would do that stuff. Because perhaps he would defile God's holies of holies. Well, you can do that today by bad doctrine. Look what he says here. Verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God, what? Destroy. Yeah, destroy. That's the same word, cut off, that Paul uses over in Galatians. Paul is saying, I am so zealous about what God has given me in this grace message that I wish God would destroy those guys who trouble you. Hey, go back to Galatians. That's what he's saying. Galatians chapter number 5, verse 12. I would. I mean, you know, the apostle Paul was the kindest man, the most gentle man when he got saved and the grace of God was upon him. He still had a little Saul of Tarsus in him, though. He still had some boldness and some some zeal for the truth of God. See, God chose the right man. This guy, Saul of Tarsus, was zealous for the traditions of his fathers. He was killing people when they were trusting Christ as Messiah until the Lord appeared to him and said, stop fighting what you see from the word. You know I'm God. He says, you're right, Lord. He still has some zeal. Being a grace believer doesn't mean it's just this little, you know, real soft and stuff. No, no, no. When it comes to doctrinal things, you, you need to be strong. Look what Paul says, verse 12. Galatians 5, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Paul says when it comes to people giving you wrong doctrine, I wish they were destroyed, cut off out of the presence of God. Now, you know that can't happen if they're saved. But where it's going to happen is we just saw is at the judgment seat of Christ. The payback is there. God does not take kindly for saints receiving bad doctrine and saints who 
hurt other saints because you're affecting members of his body. See, when you attack another saint, whether it's doctrinally destroy them or other ways, your relationship, remember, you're not attacking that person so much. You're attacking a member of Christ's body. You got to remember that. You got to be sensitive to the fact that these people you're dealing with who are believers are also members of the church, the body of Christ, like you. And that's what he's talking about. Go back with me, if you will, uh, to Acts 15. Go back to Acts 15. So, can I tell you, don't trouble the Lord, don't trouble saints. Preach the right doctrine. Uh, Brother Josh and I are going to be on the radio Thursday. I got a call from Chicago, and I was in Chicago. I was supposed to be on uh, Brother Lee Michaels. He comes in the second session. I was supposed to be on his show, uh, my monthly whatever. I come on the show to talk about race relations and stuff in, the, in, the, in, the, in America. I was supposed to be on from 3 to 4 on Thursday the 30th. Well, I get a call. They're on vacation, so they asked me to fill in the whole show. I'll, I'll be hosting the show from 3 to 6 on Thursday the 30th. I'll, I'll, I'll announce it again if you want to listen in. So I said, I was telling Chris, I said, we need to get Brother Josh on there. It, it, it flows better when you got two. It's a good experience for him. But we're going to get on there and teach the grace message. It's going to be Bible question and answer day, and we're going we're to upset some people. But they called me. You know, they said, hey, call me while I was in the session of uh, the preaching in Chicago. I said, I'll do it. I'm supposed to be there anyway. I'd love to get this grace message on there. God opens doors to get his truth out there. Well, look what he says here. You want to edify people. Verse chapter 15, look at verse number 19. So James says, wherefore my sentence is. Remember, he's sitting as a judge. We saw that last time. Sentence. He gives a sentence as a judge. Is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Now, that issue of turning to God, that's what repentance is. Whether you are a lost man and you turn to God, hold your hand here and go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Hold your hands in, in, uh, first, in Acts 15, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. You know, the, the issue of repentance comes up. And people say, well, what is repentance? I say, it's just, just turning. It's literally you're going in one direction this way, and you just bow face and head it back. God is the first one to repent, Genesis 6, verse 6. Most of the references to repentance is God himself in Scripture. So don't let people tell you repentance means being sorry for your sins, how sorry, real sorry, and all this crazy stuff. Repentance means just turn. God was going to punish the nation of Israel because of their sin of breaking the law. They repent. They repent. He repented and turned his way. They turned to him. And repentance usually is turning to God as, and when it's from the human viewpoint. Look at verse uh, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse number 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. Now watch this. Watch what the Thessalonian Gentiles did. And how you turn to God from what? Idols to serve the living and true God. Notice, Gentiles, the way they repent as lost people, they turn to God from idols. They trust the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, the cross of Christ. And then with the rest of their lives, they serve the living and true God. He calls them the living and true God because idols are false gods. They're dead gods. The living God, that term has to do with the one who's able to pour out his wrath upon everyone else. Oh, we can't even get into it. Go, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, when I was doing my study there in Chicago, my, my preaching session, um, Paul gives a, a good definition of a Gentile. Gentiles means nations. Uh, we have our beautiful chart that John and Beverly made for us. In the but now, God has a message to the Gentiles, the nations. And the Lord would say in one passage in the Gospels, all these things do the Gentiles seek after. Then he'd say all these things do the nations seek after. But amongst the Gentile nations, there's something about Gentiles. Two things. They're, they're into fornication, both physical and spiritual. 
But the spiritual fornication has to do with idols. And a Gentile, the mindset of a Gentile is to worship idols, false gods. Look at chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, that was my, this was my topic at the conference. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. These were going to be spiritual gifts that were manifest, manifested in, in the saints according to the spirit of God's will. So these were going to be people who were under the power of a spirit. It happened to be the spirit of God, okay? But before they got saved, they were under the power of spirits as well, with little s's, devils, okay? And here's how. Look what he says. Verse 2, ye know that ye were, what? Gentiles. Now watch how Paul describes them as Gentiles. Carried away unto these dumb, what? Idols, even as ye were led. The Gentiles as a whole do worship. It's not the God of creation, the God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's dumb idols who can't speak, talk things. The Bible says they make it out of wood and it can't, it, they give it eyes, but he can't see, hands he can't move, feet that don't walk. Miles, it doesn't talk. And then they take the rest of the wood and put it in their fire and bake their bread. And they don't even understand. The same, the same piece of wood they bake their bread, they just made a God that they're praying to. That's a Gentile. It says, even as ye were led. Paul tells us to be led of the Spirit of God. We grace believers are to be led of the Spirit of God. He does it through the word of God's grace, through Paul. Gentiles are led by the spirit of Satan to all type of uncleanness. That's the difference. Uh, so so they, they, they turn to God from idols. Now go back to verse 20 of Acts 15. Acts 15 and verse 20. Now, the fact that we're not under the law but under grace, it doesn't mean that there aren't grace commandments. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. There are commandments from the Lord Jesus to you and I through Paul. Grace simply means that in order to be accepted by God, your performance is not the issue. It's what Christ has done for you to be right with, in the eyes of God, at least in your justification. Now, the walk. Those Jews were saying that Gentiles needed to be circumcised to be saved and to keep the law of Moses to be justified. You can get other believers to agree that it's the cross of Christ by grace through faith plus nothing to be saved, but then they're going to put you under some performance-based acceptance system of their denomination. Paul says, uh-uh. I will give you the grace of God. Brother Dwayne's message was Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God which bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us, grace does teach us, to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, the two sides of the flesh. Ungodliness is the spiritual thing. The worldly lust is the physical carnal thing. Second Corinthians chapter number 7, he said, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. So God does want you to be holy and walk pleasing to him. Look what he says here in verse 20, Acts 15 verse 20. But, we, but that we write unto them, James says, we're going to write to these Gentiles, that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Now, what's all that? Well, we're going to use the rest of this time to look at that. All those things that he wrote in verse 20, pollution of idols, fornication, things strangled and from blood, those were things that Moses told the nation of Israel to abstain from. He took these principles out of the law and not to put them on a performance-based acceptance system, obviously. They didn't have the whole law. But these were things that were unclean and weren't good for you. The Gentiles were so used to being, living like dogs, unclean. In the Bible, a dog, they were called dogs because they're unclean, or swine because they're unclean, they're in the, in, the, in the mire. When you get out of that, when you're used to living unclean, 
and God wants you to be pure, he, 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 he gives you certain principles that will make you clean. All those things, pollution of idols, fornication, things strangled and from blood, those things are things that aren't, aren't good for you and I. They will hurt us. Also, because Acts is written from a Jewish perspective, these are things that if Gentiles did and there were Jews among them, they would offend the weak conscience of the Jews. There were Jews in the body of Christ, by the way. Paul talks about it in Romans 14. If a Jew is around you, please don't eat swine if it's offensive to them, a uh, pig. And the pork or whatever. Okay? Do it for the weaker brother. And they were the weaker brother. But he picked these four things, I believe. Look at verse 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So as these Gentiles live out here, there's Jews among them who built synagogues. And these Gentiles who seek God go into the synagogue to hear about God. You got to hear about God from a Jew in that day. And, and, and they would think, oh, since these Jews are under the law of Moses, we Gentiles have to do it too. And Paul would say, no, you don't have to keep the law. We want you to keep these four things, though, because those are unclean from you. Look, look, look at the things he brings up. Pollution of idols. Well, does God want grace believers to leave idols alone? Yes. We'll see why. How about fornication? Yeah. No, he doesn't want us doing that. Things strangled, we'll see what that is, and from blood. These are things that are bad for you. Let's look at these things. Uh, this issue of these unclean things. Hold, uh, you can leave chapter 15, go to Ezekiel chapter 4. We got about 12 minutes. Ezekiel chapter number 4. Ezekiel was a prophet of Israel. He was under the law. Ezekiel chapter number 4. You got uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 4. I just want you to see the attitude of a Jew. Look at verse 14, Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 14. Start at verse 13. And the Lord said, even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the who? Gentiles, whither I will drive them. So this is a judgment upon the Jews. God scattered them among the Gentiles, according to the law of Moses, Leviticus 26. Verse 14, then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, my soul hath not been, what's that word? Polluted. Remember he said the pollution of idols. Watch this. Notice something that pollutes your soul. Keep reading. For from my youth up, even till now, have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself or is torn in pieces. Neither came there abominable flesh into my mouth. Um, by the way, that issue of something that dieth of itself or is torn in pieces, that's what he means by the thing strangled. Um, we'd call it roadkill. You know, out here you hit a deer, it just sits out in the thing. Well, normally what the Gentiles would do, they would just eat that thing after the carcass has rotten. And, and, and get infested. It was something to keep you clean. It, you, God didn't want you to get sick off that stuff. That was one of the reasons. Uh, many other reasons with Israel, but this thing strangled. Uh, go to uh, the book of Nahum. Nahum. Y'all didn't think we'd ever get to Nahum, did you? You, even, you didn't even know that was a book of the Bible, did you? No, just kidding. You got Jonah, Micah, Nahum. This issue of things strangled. Dieth of itself. Dieth of itself is a diseased animal. Like an animal with bird flu or, 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 or something else. These little animals have all these diseases, mad cow disease. Yeah, that's a good one. And these cows just die. Obviously, if they die of themselves, they're diseased. You're not to go over there and then cut out the meat and eat the steak of a diseased animal. God had a very, you ever heard the word kosher? It's a very clean way of preparing meats and other things in the, in the nation of Israel. It's called kosher. We call it kosher today. Very clean, man. And God did that not only because they're a clean people in, in the Old Testament, but for their physical health. God would rather you eat not diseased cows, but, you know, uh, uh, clean, clean uh, beasts. They could eat steaks. You know, they could eat the meat of the, uh, the bulls and goats and stuff. Uh, Nahum chapter 2, look at verse 12. 
The lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps and strangled for his lioness and filled his holes with prey and his dens with, with raven. Um, when he talks about things strangled, he's talking about that's the way in the animal kingdom they kill, they prey. See, that lion walks up to that, or not walks, the lion runs up to the, one of those antelopes and grabs them by the neck and strangle them. That's how they kill them. That's how, that's how they kill them. They, they, they catch them under here and they strangle them. Well, he's saying that's, that's an unclean beast once that happens. There was a particular way. You catch the beast, you cleanse, clean the beast, you cook the beast. That's how God wanted it. After Genesis with Noah, he says if you can catch it, you can eat it. Change the dietary system for the, for the, for the, for the, for the uh, humanity. Up until that point, Adam and Eve could just eat fruits and vegetables. After the flood, God put enmity between the animals and humans. He put a fear on the animals of humans. And then, so that they can run away from humans. Up until that point, they just walk up and want, and want the humans to tell them what to do. We still have a little bit of that. But now, because God gave the beast for our meals, you can eat meat. Don't eat it if it died of itself, diseased. Don't eat it if it was strangled by another animal, diseased. Okay? Um, let's look more at this. Talk about the pollution of idols. Go back to... Um, First, go back to Acts chapter 15. Coming down to Acts chapter 15. So when you read that, it seems strange. He says, well, why would he tell them not to eat of things? Look, look what he says, Acts 15, verse 20. I'm just trying to give you some insight of what James is doing. But, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols. Get rid of all those idols. We'll, we'll look at that in a little bit and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. Go down to verse 28. Acts chapter 15, verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. It seemed good to who? The Holy Ghost. See, that's God. God put these lack of restrictions of the law on the Gentiles. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols. We're going to look at that and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Okay? Go over to chapter 21, Acts 21. Look at verse 25. I want you to understand what's going on about why he put those restrictions of blood, strangled, fornication, and idols. Those are bad for you. Uh, Acts chapter 21, verse 25. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, speaking of the law of Moses, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Notice the, this is a big issue. Go over to First Corinthians, excuse me, uh, go to First Corinthians chapter 8. Paul talks about it as well. First Corinthians 8. Meat is meat, right? It's meat. Why did they want them to stay away, really, from meat that was offered to idols? When he talks about the pollution of idols, he means the meat that was offered to idols. I want you to see Paul talks about that. He's going to give us some understanding. It's not a huge issue in our day, but when you read Scripture, you're going to have to know this because this comes up. So I want you to, I'm, I'm trying to help you understand these things. Back in the the this period, the first century, the way that Gentiles worshiped their idols was in what they call meat offerings and drink offerings. By the way, Gentile heathens' religious worship comes today through meat offerings of a body and drink offerings of a body. That's why you got to be very careful with that whole wafer and, 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 and cup thing that the Roman Catholicism has taken Lutherism takes it, and even our, 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 our fundamental brothers take and want to do today. Rome, Rome has, has uh, corrupted something that Christ gave his apostles about his body and blood and what Paul gave us as well, 1 Corinthians 11. Look what he says here in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Now it's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Hey, the knowledge there was this, it's just meat, it's just meat. 
But when it comes to your weaker brother, in that day you could find some offense amongst those Jews. These Gentiles would say, we can eat this meat. Paul says we can eat it. And somebody says, well, it was sacrificed to an idol. He says, so what? That wasn't his attitude. You're supposed to say, all right, brother, if that offends you, I won't eat it in your presence. Now, when you leave, I'm going to have a ball with that steak. But then let's say, well, in your presence, I won't have it, okay? Look what he says here. Go down to verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things which are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we, what's that next word? Know that an idol is nothing in the world. Paul says, we, we who know God's word know that that's just a piece of wood or, or, or silver or gold. It's nothing. And that there is none other God but one. There's God the Father, the Godhead. For though there be that are called gods, there's all type of little gods with little g's, whether in heaven or in earth, you got the angel, angel, angelic realm, you got the, the gods down here, the men who think they're gods and called gods. As there be gods many and lords many, verse 6, but to us, that's to the grace believer, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Now watch verse 7. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some would conscious of the idol unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being what? Weak is defiled. particularly Jews who are in the body of Christ, are used to being away from those meat sacrificed to idols. They would be in the body of Christ in fellowship at the Lord's Supper meal or whatever. The Gentiles would say, hey, I'm going right down there to the temple. They had the meat right out there that they sacrificed. And I'm going to get that steak and I'm going to bring it and I'm going to share it with the rest of the saints. The Jews would say, well, where'd you get that meat? Right down at the temple there. What's the problem? Oh, we can't have that. Now, the Gentile would say, brother, Paul says it's okay. It was nothing. Read the... But his conscience was weak. And the, and the gracious thing to do was to say, I'm sorry. We put it over here. All those who desire to have that meat and, and, can, and can handle it in their conscience, there it is. For the brethren who can't, we sorry. You just, we keep it over here. And that's grace. That's what he's saying. Look what he says here. Verse 8. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. It doesn't even matter to God. If you got a conscience, eat the meat, eat the meat. God says eat it. If you don't, God says don't eat it. Verse 9, but take heed lest by any means this, that next word is liberty of yours, become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat at the, in the idol's temple, Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Now, he's not perished like he dies. His, his faith is overthrown. That's the point. Verse 13. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Notice that God, Paul uses his liberty in a gracious way. That's the point, okay? The Jews said, stay away from that stuff. Paul would say, you can eat it, but don't eat it in the presence of a weaker brother who's trying to get this thing worked out in their own soul, okay? So that's what he's talking about. Um, he mentioned fornication. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're coming down to an end. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, fornication. That is more than just The fleshly thing. We have children. The fleshly type of deal. Okay? What you know. Fleshly. The Bible definition of fornication, the book of Hebrews, I believe it was Hebrews, called Esau a fornicator. It was a moment's gratification. He sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for a, a bowl of pottage, lentils and beans and soup. He didn't, he despised his birthright as the firstborn son of Isaac. And his carnal appetites was the issue. The Bible calls him a fornicator, okay? That tells you that fornic, a fornicator. 
That tells you fornication is not, just not the physical fornication we think of. But fornication, is a, it, it can be a spiritual thing, too. Okay? And what's behind fornication is uncleanness and greediness. Unclean and greed. Now watch how Paul defines it here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Stay away from it. Verse, chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, look at verse 3. Verse 2, for ye know what commandments. Notice I told you that Paul gives grace commands. We gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. You want to know what God's will is for a believer? Even your what? Sanctification. He wants you to grow in Christ through Paul. He wants you to learn about the Lord and the grace message and to be set apart for him and serve him when you're a believer. God's will of all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Now watch this. Even your sanctification. Well, Paul, what does it mean to be sanctified? That ye should abstain from fornication. Now watch how Paul describes fornication here. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and what? Honor. Talks about the Gentiles in Romans 1. They dishonor God through their bodies. Now, he's just not talking about the physical fornication. The vessel is your body. Verse 6, not in the lust of concupiscence. The definition of concupiscence is working all uncleanness with greediness. What Gentiles do is they're unclean to the nth degree. They just go and just get involved in all type of unimaginable things. Don't you be like that. Not in the lust, verse 5, of concupiscence. Even as the Gentiles, which know not God. Now watch how he defines this. That no man go beyond and what? Defraud. To defraud is to keep back something that you owe somebody. Defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. Christ is going to make you pay for it, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. Notice that when Paul talks about fornication, he says it's anything where you just go uncleanness with greediness, defrauding your brethren, keeping back love and charity to them. That's, that's what he's talking about. So don't you be like the Gentiles, which you know not God. Now we're going to end when he talks about the issue of blood. I'll give you this. In Genesis chapter 9, Let's, let's go look at it. We'll, we'll, end, we'll, we'll end in uh, a couple of passages. Get Genesis 9 and Leviticus 17. Genesis 9 and Leviticus 17. We'll end. Go way back to the first five books of the Bible. Leviticus 9. Excuse me. Genesis 9, Leviticus 17. Why did he tell them not to uh, mess around with blood? Genesis 9, this is when Noah came off the ark. Verse 1, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Same command he gave Adam. And the fear of, the, of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishers of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Now God is about to allow mankind to eat meats. Watch this. Every moving thing, verse 3, that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Dietary laws then changed. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the what? Blood thereof, you shall not eat. Interesting. One of the things the Gentiles do, now this is gross, because we don't live in this type of culture because of the grace of God in our, in our country that's being trampled on by our people. But in other heathen societies, they drink blood. And what they're doing is they're taking the life of that sacrifice that, to their God and putting it in them. We're going to take this blood, and this blood represents the life and we'll take it in, and we have life. Sounds familiar. We have some religions today that do that. Whew. 
This is the blood of life. Partake and drink of it. See, that type of stuff. Gentile heathens do that stuff. Leviticus chapter 17. Go there. Look at verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you. There's both Jew and there's the Gentile among them. That eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. Now what's going on here? Where well, later in the book of John, the Lord says, I think it's John chapter 6, because in John 6, 66, people left him because he said this. He says, if any man wants eternal life, he needs to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now he meant spiritually. And the Jews were like, oh, that's a hard saying. And then they didn't walk. See, that blood of that bull and that goat represents the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ there at Calvary. That was the picture in Israel. And God wouldn't let them do that like the heathen do to try to get it outside of Christ. He, he was pointing them to Christ. Look what he says here. I'm going to cut them off. Verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the where? Altar. Where was Israel to seek the blood of life? There on the altar and with a mercy seat, which became the altar here at Calvary. That's the type of it, where Christ shed his precious blood, the blood of the Lamb of God, the man, Christ Jesus. God said, don't be out there like the heathen. Your blood life is there on the altar. And look what it does. For the life, verse 11, of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So he wouldn't allow them to drink it like the heathen. He says, take that blood and put it on the altar. Type of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, our glorified bodies, the Lord says, it's made up of flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. See, blood, he only needed blood, a human body, to, to make the atonement at Calvary. In his resurrected body, his glorified body, even though he got the marks, he's flesh and bone. There's no blood in there. He don't need blood now. You got the spirit. It's a spiritual body. Now, we're going to end in Leviticus 15, and here's why. I get this question a lot from unbelievers, atheists and stuff. I don't deal with them because they don't. I can give them 100 things from the scriptures. The way you deal with an atheist is to deal with them scientifically, and you can show them that God put things in the Bible way back in Job, that mankind hasn't discovered until the 18 and 1900s. And what you do with atheists, you say, how did Job know this thousands of years ago? How did he write it down when mankind just discovered it in 1815? Hmm, yeah. God put all these restrictions in the law because he wanted Israel to be healthy. The heathen would do all these nasty things, excuse me, these... Uh, I can't say that word, my wife says, because all these unclean things. But God had Israel who separated. They knew about health and all that stuff thousands of years before science has been able to see all of these microscopic anti, you know, bacterial type of things. That shows you God wrote this book and he gave wisdom to people thousands of years ago before the heathen ever got it. I'm going to show you one. Something real simple. Leviticus 15, look at verse 13. We'll end. Leviticus 15, verse 13. To me, this is fantastic. Leviticus 15, 13. And when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing and wash his clothes. Now watch this. And bathe his flesh in what type of water? Running, Running water and shall be clean. Just something simple as the whole thing of running water. 1,500 years, 2,000, 3,500 years ago. Do you know just recently the whole issue of the, the clean, cleanliness of running water, the Gentiles would bathe themselves in sitting water, and you can get the, you know, what happens when you have sitting water. That, that was the custom in the world. Way back, 3,500 years ago, way before Gentiles even thought about the impurities that can happen with sitting water, God, who's God, had Israel cleanse themselves like we shower, running water. It's all, God's wisdom 
in this, in this book is two, 3,000 years ahead of science. You know that? Little, something just as little as running water. The, the Gentiles didn't do that. They would bathe in sitting water and get all types of diseases and stuff. God says to avoid that, just do some running water. You see that? I just picked something small like that. But it's, it's marvelous how wise God is. This book was written by the God of creation, and you can trust it. Let us pray.